It was one of the most horrifying and painful chapters in Los Angeles history. In a five-month period from October 1977 to February of 1978, 10 young women turned up dead. All but one of their bodies found dotting hillsides in northeast Los Angeles and Glendale. The bodies were very clean, except for the little bit of debris that they had on them from where they were uh, thrown or placed. And they were devoid of all clothing. The women had been sexually assaulted and strangled with a cord or rope. And the way they died was particularly brutal. They were not strangled in a jerking motion, but rather in a method that slowly suffocated the victim. It wasn't long before police knew there was a serial killer on the loose. At the morgue, they compared the bodies of the second and third victims. As the coroner said, who was working with us on the case, as it looks like they came out of a Xerox machine. Uh, and they did. Other than the body size, they looked the same. The ligature marks were very unique. They're five-point ligatures, meaning the neck, each wrist, and each ankle. Tensions reached a fever pitch during Thanksgiving of 1977, when five bodies were found in a week. Two of which were our youngest victims, Johnson and Cepeda. They were 12 and 14. And once that happened, there was no turning back as far as the media was concerned. The hillside strangler apparently has struck again. The body of the latest victim, 18-year-old Lauren Wagner, was found sprawling across a sidewalk. A wave of fear swept some neighborhoods, people wondering when and where the strangler might strike again. It's very frightening. He's sick. That's all I can say. It's just insane. From the beginning, the murders baffled police. In every case, the victims had been killed somewhere else and then transported to the scene. We had no crime scene. We're starting at a place where a body's been placed, so the lack of evidence is obvious. There isn't any. At the height of the investigation, a special task force was set up in Parker Center, the headquarters of the Los Angeles police. Dozens of investigators fielded the thousands of tips that were pouring in, but they couldn't crack the case. The bodies were piling up, and we had no results to show for it. In fact, the task force knew very little about the Hillside Strangler, except for one thing. There was always a thought, at least in my mind, that we were dealing with more than one killer. Some of the areas were not accessible for just one person to lay a dead body in without some help from somebody. But police had no real proof that there were two Hillside Stranglers until the eighth murder, that of 18-year-old Lauren Wagner in November of 1977. There was a witness to her abduction. A neighbor observed two males. That confirmed our belief from the beginning that there were two bad guys. And what made these cases all the more frightening was that, except for the ligature marks, almost all of the victims' bodies were free of trauma. There was no indication that they put up a struggle. So that led to the theory that the killers were somebody that was in a position of trust. Could they have been police officers? Certainly, they, uh, that was a thought. Could they have been portraying themselves as police officers? Absolutely. So this further uh, terrorized women. They were arming themselves. They were afraid of being stopped by police officers for traffic infractions, thinking that might be the hillside strangler. Then, after police found the body of the last victim, 20-year-old Cindy Hudspeth, in the trunk of her car on February 17, 1978, the killings abruptly ceased. But police knew it was too good to be true. A serial murder is not just going to stop. In other words, he just doesn't turn the light switch off and say, I'm through killing. It would take a double murder 11 months later in the small seaport town of Bellingham, Washington, to finally solve the riddle of the Hillside Stranglers. There, in January of 1979, two Western Washington University co-eds, Diane Wilder and Karen Mandick, were murdered. Police found their bodies in Karen's car. The coroner's report indicated that both had died of strangulation caused by a ligature. 
The Bellingham police arrested a 26-year-old security guard by the name of Kenneth Bianchi. He had left so many clues that police quickly tied him to the crime. Noticing that Kenneth Bianchi carried an L.A. driver's license, Bellingham police telephoned the L.A. County Sheriff's Office for a background check. Sergeant Frank Salerno was off duty when his lieutenant called him with the news. And he says, well, we got a call from Bellingham, Washington, and they have two murders up there, two young ladies that appear similar to ours, not totally the same, but they've got a suspect in custody, and they asked us to do a background on him. His name is Bianchi. When they checked him out, they were stunned at what they found. Kenneth Bianchi had lived in the same apartment building as one of the Strangler's victims and across the street from another. We were quite excited because he was the first suspect we had that we could connect somehow to our victims. The detectives immediately flew to Bellingham where they viewed the remains of the Washington State victims. They examined the two bodies carefully and compared the ligatures with photos they had of some of the other Los Angeles victims and were pretty certain we had the right person that Bianchi was indeed the Hillside Strangler. But if Kenneth Bianchi was the Hillside Strangler, he wasn't talking. It would take 10 months in the Whatcom County Jail before he finally agreed to cooperate with police. Then in marathon sessions in the fall of 1979, the L.A. homicide detectives finally got a chance to question Bianchi about the murders. My name is Sergeant Salerno from Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. When we pinned him up against the wall, uh, we smoked cigars, we made it very uncomfortable in there. Asked you specifically, had you ever been there before, and you said no. I went there at night. He kind of scatterbrained it around a little bit. Now all of a sudden you're going to change your story. I'm not going to change my story. But in telling us what he did tell us, he firmed our belief that this is the guy because some of the information that we received from him was information only the murderer would have known. He said, well, the thing we can do is, is put her in her car. I said, but yeah, if you drive her car, you can leave fingerprints. He said, well, I, I can fix that. He says, I've got uh, some rubber gloves. Under questioning, Bianchi confirmed what the police had suspected all along. He had not been in it alone. His partner in crime was his cousin, Angelo Bono. I was standing behind her and Angelo was standing in front of her and there was no more struggle after that. Police would soon learn that when it came to murder, the cousins were two of a kind. The chemistry uh, was what propelled them into killing. I don't think they could have started separately, but together they were a quite dangerous team of killers. In 1979, with one of the Hillside Stranglers, Kenneth Bianchi, jailed in Washington State, investigators began to learn more about him and his cousin, Angelo Bono. Angelo Bono was really the dominant one of the two. Kenneth Bianchi was his much younger cousin who came to California and essentially latched on to Angelo Bono. Bianchi was literally afraid of, of Bono, thought that he was a tough guy who might even kill you if you messed around with him. They were not similar, but together they created a kind of an evil. 43-year-old Angelo Bono was the quiet and practical one. Physically unattractive, he spoke with a lisp. He wasn't well educated particularly, uh, but he wasn't dumb in any sense. He, he had a lot of street smarts. He liked to think of himself as tough, and I think liked to give people the impression that he was somehow connected with the Mafia. Bono kind of thought of himself as kind of a dashing young guy. He had great success with women, unlike his cousin, Kenneth Bianchi. Bianchi had a tough time with broads. I mean, he may have been glib and a, a smooth, sweet talker, but most women saw it right through him. He had no substance. Unlike Bono, who was successful at business, Bianchi couldn't hold a job. He came across as a con man. He was the kind of person that if he told you today was Monday, and it was Monday, you'd go seek a second opinion. Like most serial killers, both Ken and Angelo lacked a conscience. Bianchi and Bono were pure sociopaths. The only thing that mattered to them was 
exercising the power and control over their victim's life. And that meant squeezing the last breath of life from their dying victim's body. That's what made them feel good. The older of the two, Angelo Bono Jr., was born on October 5, 1934, in Rochester, New York. After his parents' divorce five years later, he moved to Los Angeles with his mother and older sister. They settled in Glendale in this small frame bungalow, where his mother struggled to make ends meet. Angelo attended local schools, but barely learned to read and write. It seemed that he had other things on his mind. This is a kid that was oversexed, always making overtures to the girls. Uh, he was a sexual predator from early on, from very early on. He quit school at 16 and was arrested for stealing cars. But even a stay in a reformatory did nothing to deter a youth whose hero was Carol Chessman, California's notorious serial rapist who was executed in 1960. Carol Chessman also used the badge of a police officer to lure victims, and this is likely where Angelo got the idea. Still, Angelo was not without talent. Jobs working in garages led to a trade in auto upholstery. Soon he had money enough to spend on the girls he met hanging out on the streets of Glendale. Some of his former workmates said women would walk in the shop and sometimes within 10 minutes he'd have talked him into going into the restroom with them. By the time he was 35, Angelo Bono had a succession of girlfriends, wives, and eight children born in and out of wedlock. But none of his relationships lasted. He was a sexual sadist who victimized even his family. He brutalized his wife, who was married to for many years, and frequently tied her up to have sex with her. Interesting enough, he tied her up by the ankles and by the wrist. But his sexual perversions didn't stop him from making a good living at auto upholstery. In mid-1975, Angelo finally went into business for himself with the purchase of his dream house. Located at 703 East Colorado Street in Glendale, it came with a small garage in the back that he turned into Angelo's trim shop. He did one of Frank Sinatra's cars. He did a car belonging to one of the Supremes. He usually had some Rolls Royce type cars or limousines around that he was doing. And living alone, he used his waterbed to full advantage. He had a lot of women that, that came to see him, but he had a lot of teenage girls that he was involved with. And that meant there was a lot of statutory rape in his life. It was into this house and into this lifestyle that Angelo's young cousin, Kenneth Bianchi, came in January of 1976. They were not cousins by birth. Ken had been adopted. Born in Rochester, New York, on May 22, 1951, Ken's mother was a young prostitute who had given him up at birth. When Ken was three months old, he was taken home by Angelo's Aunt Frances and her husband, Nicholas Bianchi. The couple later adopted him. His father was described as a very passive man who worked in a brake shoe company, I believe. And he did not have very much to do with the raising of the child. It was his mother who really was a very strong influence on him. It was his mother who took him to the hospital when he was seven because he couldn't stop wetting his pants. The losing of the urine during the daytime perhaps was an expression of his anger. It was his way to mistreat his mother. In fact, uh, when he was a child, his mother made him wear a sanitary napkin, which was also humiliating to him. We really don't know to what extent Frances was abusive, uh, but she was definitely very anxious in the, the way that she treated him. A psychiatrist who examined him believes that, as a child, Ken developed a love-hate relationship with his mother that became the template for his later ambivalence towards women. He would idealize women, and he would also abuse and hate women. He also saw some women as Madonnas and others as prostitutes. As a child, Ken lied as soon as he could talk. When his mother once found him with his pocket stuffed with candy, he denied stealing it, even though she had caught him red-handed. Although he was bright, he didn't do well in school and was often disruptive in class. He had a bad temper, so, you know, he was just simply not doing well as a child. He suffered, uh, undoubtedly, and I think what happened as a result is that he developed a 
profound sense of powerlessness. Then, when he was 14, his father suddenly dropped dead at work. When he died, his mother made Kenneth wear his father's shoes to the funeral. A little boy doesn't have the size feet that his father had, so he must have felt inadequate. In high school, his feelings of inadequacy only got worse. A classmate remembers him as a boy with serious acne and no friends. I never knew anyone that Ken actually hung out with on a regular basis. He would seem to flit from group to group. He never seemed comfortable around people. He just became more and more of a loner. And even then, Steve Mackey says, there was something strange about him. You, know, you look at him, and the eyes were kind of empty. The smile on his face wasn't carried through into his eyes, and it wasn't carried through into the rest of his mannerisms as well. After graduation, Ken decided he wanted to be a policeman. He signed up for courses in police science and psychology at a local community college, but soon dropped out. When the sheriff's office turned him down for a job, he decided to become the next best thing, a security guard. I think that the original idea of becoming a security officer or a policeman was his way of dealing with his tremendous feelings of inadequacy. As a police officer, he had power. And as we came to understand him in these crimes, it was important for him to feel powerful. Being a security guard also gave him the opportunity to steal. Although he was never arrested for theft, he was forced to change jobs frequently. By January of 1976, Kenneth Bianchi found himself at loose ends, living in Rochester. He just was going nowhere. It was at that point that his mother contacted Angelo Bono in L.A. and said, could my son come and stay with you? In January of 1976, Kenneth Bianchi moved to California and was living with his older cousin Angelo Bono in Glendale. Personally, they didn't get along. They had a lot of fights. But Kenny shared in when the young girls were staying at the house, Kenny shared in that activity. With Angelo needling him to get a job, Ken applied to the Glendale Police Department. His interview with them was revealing. I like to work with people, and I can't think of any job where you would come more in contact with people in the law enforcement field. There's no depth to anything that he offered in the interview, and they didn't accept him. Ken finally managed to find work with a land title company, researching property ownership records in downtown L.A. With a new job, Ken moved out of Angelo's house in July of 1976 to an apartment six blocks away at 809 East Garfield Avenue. Life was looking up in other ways as well. At a New Year's Eve party, Ken began to date a woman named Kelly Boyd, who was originally from Bellingham, Washington. By May, she was pregnant, and the couple moved to 1950 Tamarind Avenue in Hollywood. Always looking to pick up some extra money, Ken cooked up a criminal scheme. He conned a psychologist into letting him use his office space and saw patients. It was his way of meeting women, and posing as a psychologist gave him a tremendous feeling of power. What also gave Ken a sense of power was a prostitution service he ran with Angelo in the summer of 1977. The cousins recruited two young girls, Sabra Hannon and Rebecca Gay Spears, and forced them into prostitution. Angelo just told her that, you know, he'd break her leg, she just had to stay in line. It was the beginning of their partnership in crime. They kind of tried out the idea that they trusted one another and they could break the law and get away with it and be successful as a team. But when the girls escaped after a few months, the cousins were furious. They lost this business that was fairly lucrative. I think they had a hostility and that was even greater than what they'd had before towards prostitutes. On the night of October 17th, Bono and Bianchi were cruising Hollywood Boulevard when they picked up a 19-year-old black prostitute, Yolanda Washington. I'm convinced that Bono drove the car Bianchi got out of the car and did a very credible job of pretending to be a detective type undercover officer. Presented a badge and convinced her she was under arrest and put handcuffs on her and put her into the car. They then drove north on the Hollywood freeway. Eventually, in the back seat, Bianchi killed her. It was probably seat of the pants on that first murder. 
but I think at that point they'd really crossed the line. They'd committed a murder. Once they killed their first victim, Yolanda Washington, it became easier and easier to kill again. As the cases come along, there's a little more planning. There's a little more sitting down and discussing what we're going to do. They developed their M.O. with their second victim, a 15-year-old runaway and prostitute named Judy Miller. On October 30th, the cousins picked up Judy at a diner near the corner of Sunset and Sweetser. They then drove her back to Angelo's house. There, they tied her up by the legs and wrists, blindfolded her, and put her in a chair while they figured out what they were going to do with her. As Bianchi put it, who was going to go first, who was going to go second, whether they were going to flip a coin. In Angelo's spare bedroom, they raped and strangled Judy, perfecting the method they would use on their later victims. The ligature mark on the neck was used for strangling with a rope. It was also used to tie bags over their head. They used plastic bags to try to induce suffocation. They dumped Judy's body on a quiet street near Glendale, where it was discovered the next day. But the cousins had left behind a valuable clue. The only piece of physical evidence we found at the scene was a small tuft of fiber, maybe as big around as your little finger, and it was on her eyelid. It would take almost two years, however, before police had something to match it to. The motive behind the killings is less of a mystery. The motivation was to achieve a sense of power, to get a, a sense of excitement at the expense of their poor victims. The SOBs were having fun. They were into uh, fun and games. I said, uh, why'd you untie her legs? I thought you wanted to have them, have them tied down. He said, no, it wasn't any fun that way. Psychiatrist Saul Fairstein ties all the murders to the times Kenneth Bianchi was not having sex with Kelly. The murders in Los Angeles took place when his common-law wife was pregnant, and the murders in Bellingham took place when she was nursing. Former prosecutor Roger Boren, however, doesn't think that Bianchi was even in it for the sex. I believe Bono did almost all of the sex, and Bianchi did all, if not or most, of the strangulation and that it was done simultaneously and it served each of their own purposes. And they began to target women who weren't prostitutes. Victim number three was Lisa Caston, a 21-year-old woman who was a waitress at a health food restaurant. With Lisa's murder, the killers became even more daring, abducting her close to her home. On November 6, police found her nude, lifeless body near the Chevy Chase Country Club in Glendale. The way Bianchi told it, there were days when they said, uh, hey, Angelo, you want to go out? And Angelo said, yeah, let's go out. And that was it. They'd get in the car and go. It was one of the most horrifying and painful chapters in Los Angeles history. In a five month period from October 1977 to February of 1978, 10 young women turned up dead. All but one of their bodies found dotting hillsides in Northeast Los Angeles and Glendale. The bodies were very clean, except for a little bit of debris that they had on them from where they were. Uh, thrown or placed and they were devoid of all clothing the women had been sexually assaulted and strangled with a cord or rope and the way they died was particularly brutal they were not strangled in a jerking motion but rather in a method that slowly suffocated the victim it wasn't long before police knew there was a serial killer on the loose at the morgue, they compared the bodies of the second and third victims. As the coroner said, who was working with us on the case, is it looks like they came out of a Xerox machine. Uh, and they did. Other than the body size, they looked the same. The ligature marks were very unique. They're five-point ligatures, meaning the neck, each wrist, and each ankle. 
Tensions reached a fever pitch during Thanksgiving of 1977, when five bodies were found in a week. Two of which were our youngest victims, Johnson and Cepeda. They were 12 and 14. And once that happened, there was no turning back as far as the media was concerned. The hillside strangler apparently has struck again. The body of the latest victim, 18-year-old Lauren Wagner, was found sprawling across a sidewalk. A wave of fear swept some neighborhoods, people wondering when and where the strangler might strike again. Very frightening. He's sick. That's all I can say. It's just insane. From the beginning, the murders baffled police. In every case, the victims had been killed somewhere else and then transported to the scene. We had no crime scene. We're starting. She had made a notation about him in her date book that she got. Thought he was a real phony. He was not a very careful serial killer. Most of them target absolute strangers. On November 19th, Angelo and Ken abducted Christina from her home, telling her that someone had crashed into her car parked out front. They then took her to Angelo's house, where they killed her in a particularly grisly fashion. I think they got cockier. I think that they like to experiment. It's that you know, ratcheting up the level of violence that we see in teen killers. When injections of cleaning fluid into Christina's arm and neck failed to kill her, the cousins finished her off with gas. As the murders mounted, Bianchi and Bono continued their sadistic experiments. When police found the body of 18-year-old Lauren Wagner on November 29th, they noticed something unusual. She had burn marks on her hands that uh, did not look like they were from a cigarette. Police later learned that the cousins had taped electrical wires to Lauren's hands, attempting to electrocute her. But in their cruelty, they had left behind some important forensic evidence. There's still adhesive uh, on her hands where tape had been placed and attached uh, or stuck to the adhesive was some fibrous material. Like the fiber found in the Judy Miller case, it would be almost two years before they had something to match it to. But at the time, it was the eighth murder that went unsolved. With each new case, we felt this is the case that was going to break it. And then it would you'd just run into the brick wall again. Angelo Bono and Kenneth Bianchi would kill together two more times. On December 13th, Bianchi used this payphone at the Hollywood Public Library to call a 22-year-old prostitute named Kimberly Diane Martin. He told her to come to an empty apartment on the first floor of 1950 Tamarin Street, the same apartment building where Ken lived with his girlfriend. They did something to her in that building. And she had a skull fracture that indicated she'd been hit. Then they took her to Angelo's, where they finished the job. Police found her body on a steep hillside in Echo Park the next day. Ironically, several days after the murder, Ken participated in the LAPD's ride-along program, which gave citizens a chance to accompany police officers in their patrol cars. He wanted to find out what the police knew. He asked the ride-along officer questions about the Hillside Strangler killings. Then, for over two months, the cousins didn't kill. And then you started wondering, oh, where did they go? Where are they? What stopped them? I would say to probably why there was so much time in between. Where was that? Um, Angel's mother being sick and uh, work piling up in the shop and just different elements. And then all of a sudden, we get our last victim. On February 17th, 1978, an orange Datsun was spotted at the bottom of a cliff off Angela's Crest Highway. In the trunk was the body of 20-year-old Cindy Hudspeth. She worked at Glendale Community College and lived at 800 East Garfield Street, the same street where Bianchi had once lived. There's no indication that they ever knew each other before that, but he did live across the street from her. On February 16th, she went to Angelo's shop to get new floor mats for her car. Ken showed up unexpectedly. And Bono had this beautiful, ready-shared young girl there uh, and uh, was talking to her and uh, during that conversation they Bono and Bianchi decide let's do her. I then place my hand on her neck <clears throat> told her to keep quiet and sit there. 
and said, oh my God, my God, what's going on? And um, they ended up sexually assaulting her and killing her. There would be no more Hillside Strangler cases in Los Angeles. After their 10th murder, Angelo Bono decided to call it quits. Kenny was getting out of control, and probably in the way they were approaching women or whatever. We know that on the day of the last murder, they tried to abduct another woman, and they botched that. They had a breakup. Bono told him to get out of his life. I'm going to kill you. By now, Bianchi's girlfriend, Kelly Boyd, had given birth to their son and had moved to Bellingham, Washington, to be close to her family. Ken decided to join her there. You've heard it said that serial killers can't stop. Well, that may or may not be true. It looks like Angelo Bono did stop, whereas Ken Bianchi liked it so much, loved the idea of killing him, that he continued. With no new Hillside Strangler cases after February of 1979, the city of L.A. calmed down. The trail went cold and, for the most part, the task force was disbanded. That May, Kenneth Bianchi moved to Bellingham, Washington, where he joined his girlfriend and their newborn son. There, he found work as a security guard. But it seems, even without Angelo, he had murder on his mind. When he was on his own, he still wanted to kill. He hadn't satiated that need, but he also uh, couldn't pull it off by himself. Bono was much more clever and probably uh, uh, able to control things better than Bianchi. I mean, Bianchi does a double murder in Bellingham, Washington, and he's caught almost immediately. On January 11th, Bianchi lured 22-year-old Karen Mandick, a college student he knew from one of his security jobs, to an empty house he was guarding while the owners were away. She brought along her roommate, Diane Wilde. He took Karen Mandick into the house by herself, had her go down the stairs in front of him, and murdered her on the staircase. We believe he then went and got Diane and had her precede him down the staircase, where he ligature strangled her as well. He then dumped their bodies into Karen's hatchback and drove the car to a secluded spot. It is interesting that Bianchi doesn't get caught until he kills by himself. One of the girls did tell her boyfriend what was going to happen, and there was also a note left behind. So when the girls became missing, the police already had a tip as to who they were hooked up with, that it was Kenneth Bianchi. Executing a search warrant at Ken's house, police found items stolen from his job as a security guard. With Bianchi in custody for burglary, police began to build a case against him for the double murder in Washington state. And after a routine background check linked his LA address to some of the Hillside Strangler victims, he was tied to the 10 murders in Los Angeles. With 12 counts of first degree murder hanging over his head, Ken Bianchi decided to feign insanity under hypnosis, he faked the symptoms of multiple personality disorder. This is the actual videotape of his psychiatric examination. Hi. Are you Ken? Do I look like Ken? Oh, it is the Ken, is it? No, it's not. It's Steve. Oh, okay, Steve. Ken goes into this thing where suddenly he's, uh, instead of being Kenneth Bianchi, mild-mannered, nice guy, he's this raw, rough, nasty, snarling murderer who implicates his cousin Bono immediately. I killed her. Angelo killed her. They mean the wanker when Angelo killed. This broad I've never seen before. This broad I killed. These two Angelo killed. It would take one of the world's foremost experts in hypnosis, the late Dr. Martin Orne, to uncover his deception. Orne examined Bianchi and proved that his behavior was inconsistent with the person who had been hypnotized. So his ultimate conclusion that the hypnosis had been faked was consistent with the whole notion that the multiple personality was faked and the defense was faked. To avoid the death penalty, Bianchi agreed to plead guilty to five of the Hillside Strangler murders and the two murders in Bellingham. I can't find the words to express the sorrow I feel for what I've done. In no way can I take away the pain they have given to others. He cried tears in court, but it was immediately laughing and joking in the quarter outside the 
courtroom within minutes after that. As part of his plea agreement, Ken also agreed to testify in court against his cousin, Angelo Bono. Finally, in October of 1979, the Los Angeles police began to close in on Angelo. For months, they had him under surveillance. Now they questioned him for the first time. Detective Sergeant Bob Grogan showed him pictures of the victims. And uh, his response basically was, yeah, I saw a picture in the paper. Yeah, I saw a picture in the paper. And uh, it just kind of ticked me off a little bit that this no good son of a bitch could go through this so nonchalantly like I was showing him pictures of baseball players. I mean, no reaction, no reaction. In executing search warrants at his house, police found physical evidence linking Bono to the crimes. Materials taken from his house and shop were later matched to the fibers found on Judy Miller and Lauren Wagner. On October 19th, the police arrested Angelo Bono. He was charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder. I don't remember him saying a significant word. We took him to the county jail and booked him, and he, my name is blah, blah, blah. No emotion. None. The trial of Hillside Strangler Angelo Bono began on November 16, 1981, and lasted two years and two days. It was one of the longest murder trials in United States history. It was like trying 10 separate murder cases, so it was like doing one trial after another. On top of that, you had Kenneth Bianchi. Kenneth Bianchi was perhaps the most closely examined witness in the history of jurisprudence. But prosecutors Roger Bourne and Michael Nash knew from the beginning that Bianchi would be unpredictable on the stand. After confessing in Bellingham, he had later recanted, so they decided not to rely on his testimony alone. There was sufficient evidence linking Bono to the crimes, whether the jury believed Bianchi or not. True to form, Bianchi still had some surprises up his sleeve when Michael Nash began his questioning. I asked him if he had committed these murders. First answer was, as you might expect, I don't know. It went from I don't know to maybe I remember bits and pieces. But a lot of times he'd just go with the flow and say, you know, we did this and we did that. During the six months that Ken was on the stand, he and Angelo barely exchanged glances. Bono would sit there and occasionally he was the killer and he made a deal to save his life. of nine out of the ten murders. Angelo Bono was only acquitted for the murder of the first victim, Yolanda Washington. We did a pretty strong job of showing that if they did one, they had to have done them all. During the penalty phase of the trial, it only took the jury an hour to decide to spare Angelo's life. I think jurors from what we heard felt that both defendants were equally culpable and that if one got life the other one should too. On January 9th, 1984, presiding judge Ronald George formally sentenced Angelo Bono and Kenneth Bianchi. He didn't mince words. I would not have the slightest reluctance to impose the death penalty in this case were it within my power to do so. It would have been very nice because I would have tended that with my finest suit it probably would have been the most like, happiest thing that ever happened in my life to watch that SOB die. Uh, he did die in prison eventually. On September 21st, 2002, Angelo Bono died of natural causes. He was 67. I got called on vacation. And, uh, my only comment was the death penalty it just took a long time to uh, take place. No, it's interesting. Never said a word to anybody, even when he was in jail kept, you know, the old mafia oath, don't tell anybody anything.
Under the terms of his plea agreement, Kenneth Bianchi received life sentences in Washington State and in California. He had wanted to serve a sentence in California, but the judge refused to let him. He had not cooperated, he had not been truthful to a large extent. I sent him back to Washington State to serve the balance of his time. Now I think he's saying he's totally innocent and we framed him. It's the character you're dealing with. In an interview in February of 2004, Ken Bianchi denied his guilt. I didn't do it. I'm sorry for your loss, but I didn't do it. I don't know who did it. And I said that 25 years ago. The crimes of Bianchi and Buono illustrate what can happen when two sociopaths find one another and decide to kill me. These were some of the worst criminals that I've ever seen because there was nothing about the heat of passion. There was no diminished mental capacity or insanity. They killed because of the momentary sexual gratification of raping and then killing their victims. And I always felt such sympathy and empathy for the parents and the survivors that they would the rest of their life deal with this stuff that these two animals perpetrated on them. It's incredible.